talk to you about why I think computer science is important, why I think everyone should have a go at it, and also how you can actually use it to do things you probably haven't imagined. I mean, it's one of those things I, I can't ask you any questions because I can't see you, but how many of you can read and write? Not many. Okay, right, that's a problem. Okay, you need to go and learn to read and write. But reading and writing is obviously clearly an important thing. We all do in schools. It's, it's essential. And it's not essential for the reasons people did hundreds of years ago, which was to write religious tomes or legal documents or to work in a banking system or something, you know, where you'd actually have to write ledgers and things. And if you were a farmer, you wouldn't need to learn to read or write because it wasn't essential for you in the slightest. But, of course, today... We all know that reading and writing is essential because you can write letters and to-do lists and shopping lists and poems and plays and books and books and books. There's a lot of books going on around today. Um, and I think that's a critical thing. We, we take those things for granted. And computer science and programming, in my opinion, is, is the same. It's not that they, they're identical, but actually, as society grows, we'll start to understand the actual, the massive, creative, and uh, what would it really expressive power of programming and what it can do for us. Because we, Herb just mentioned Steve Jobs and, and, and the guy Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. And when you go into schools, and I'm going to talk about extensively now about schools, and you try and engage the next generation of programmers, is it, is it good to say, hey, you could be the next Steve Jobs? Is that really the thing that's going to motivate people? You know, like, you can be good at business. Is business the, really the, the thing that we want to get our kids excited about? I mean, it's pretty important, and if you use technology in business, you can, you can do amazing things. But is reading and writing only for religious documents? Is reading and writing only for legal prose? Clearly not. So is programming only for business? I don't think so at all, and I'd like to show you uh, why I'm, it's not the case. Uh, is there any chance I can get me? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, look at this. Um, so this is the system I've built. It's called Sonic Pi. Uh, it, was, it was tackling the problem. Ten years ago, uh, we had a, a computer science curriculum introduced to schools, which was amazing. Um, and that was Simon Peter Jones, so a wonderful programmer, formed a group called CAS, Computing at Schools, lobbied the government to get uh, algorithms and data structures and all these fun computer science concepts taught in schools, which is great, except for... There wasn't that much good resources, and the teachers needed a lot of help and education and training, and that was a real problem. And at that time, uh, and, and obviously computers were expensive, so that, that, interesting, at that time, the Raspberry Pi computer was created. It spun out of the University of Cambridge, and that sort of tackled the problem of cost, that you can now get, a, 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 if you got $35 or £25, you could buy one of these computers, plug into your television, and you can learn to do technology things which is great, except for this, this Raspberry Pi was very low-powered, and not low-powered in terms of, of power, but in terms of compute power. And there wasn't much stuff you could do, and, and the software that ran it on it wasn't that great. Um, and so there was a challenge to find, ways to, find to, to, ways to actually get software on that computer that could teach kids to code. And so I actually was still a researcher at Cambridge at that time, and I was doing weird things with music and programming languages, so I kind of raised my hand and said, hey, I could perhaps help out here and take my ideas and build something that kids could learn to code with, which was actually about making music. And so I built this tool, um, and here's the website. You can download it, uh, and let's go down here. I, I think, actually, yeah, look, I do have a book. It's totally free, <laughs> right? I'm not going to sign it because it's digital, but please do download it if you want to. Um, not selling it. I'm not selling anything here. Um, but I also wrote, uh, when I was collaborating with the Raspberry Pi Foundation, I wrote a really nice article for educators here, and that really kind of emphasised the issue of, of how you might actually teach these computer science concepts. And if you go to a school and you teach uh, algorithms, the kids don't know what that means and why it's relevant and how it has any benefit for them as a child, right? And if, I, I, we taught these lessons, we taught like, things called variables, and the children were just creating a variable. That you, know, you don't even know what it needs to mean because... They just they got these names, and they were calling them Justin Bieber and Coca-Cola. And like, I made my variables, sir. What do I do with them? Like, don't really know. Right? You need to use these things in interesting ways. But the curriculum just says variables, and we've taught you variables, and you don't really know what to do with them. So I was thinking about how you could actually uh, apply musical ideas. So instead of uh, data structures like lists of things, you might have melodies. You might have riffs. You might have selecting different sounds. You might iterate, which is a fancy word for repetition. 
You might repeat, because in dance music, there's a lot of repetition. So by framing the computer science in music, it seemed a really nice way to teach these concepts. But actually, it turned out to be really powerful, not just because once you build a system that does this, that's quite fun, you can teach it. But actually, the problem turned into something more profound, I found, which wasn't, can you teach computer science in schools? It's, how do you get the kids to listen to you? So the, the computer science people had the great idea of, of asking the old programmers what got them excited about programming. And they were like, oh yeah, sorting algorithms. So they wrote like a scheme of work that said, have fun with sorting. I mean, that obviously got the kids excited. And the other one I read, which blew my mind, was give binary a try. Because <laughs> obviously it's like drugs or something. Have you actually tried binary? Like, like, you know. So I, I, these never really engage the kids. So I, I, I was really interested in finding ways to do it. Um, and, it, and the engagement was a critical thing um, because it turned into um, uh, uh, the critical idea of where Sonic Pi was going. It wasn't just about, can we teach computer science, it's how do we engage them. So this article starts off with me talking about this futuristic idea of where we could be in the future. The, the lights, they slice the mist as the rhythms move the crowd and the atmosphere ripe with a heady mix of synths. However, something wasn't quite right. Projected in the bright colors above the performer was futuristic text Moving, dancing, flashing. This wasn't fancy visuals. This was merely a projection of the free live coding system, Sonic Pi. And the musician wasn't spinning discs. She was writing, editing, and evaluating code live. This was live code. Now, this is me imagining the world I wanted to, to, to project. Because if we have the equivalent of Jimi Hendrix, you know, that's what the kids are going to say, or Taylor Swift, or, or some musician that's really inspiring to the children. And you say to them, do you want to be like that person? Like, yes, please. Uh, what, what do I need to do? Uh, oh, they're using code to make their music. The kids are going to really going to start learning code. You know? Whereas if you say, you need to learn code because it's on the curriculum, it's not really going to cut it. Now, what I found really interesting is, let's go over here. Here is that scene. Here's a nightclub in New York. And on stage is a performer. She's called DJ Dave. And she's using my system, Sonic Pi, to perform to these people. These people are seeing a professional coder code, not making business software or analytics or very dry things, but actually making music that they're all raving to and dancing to. And so when they see her perform, they're seeing code in a new frame that, that shows it's not just a tool, as I'm saying, for business, but a tool for expression. And, and I, I'm really excited about to see more and more performers like her uh, take the stage and do amazing things. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give, give you a quick introduction about how you could actually do this. Um, and uh, if there are any programmers amongst you, this is actually quite useful. Um, because, uh, I don't know, I struggle when I go to parties. I mean, I don't go anymore because people don't invite me. But when I used to go to parties, uh, people used to ask me, hi, what's your name? I go, Sam, what do you do? I'm a programmer. And they go, oh. Like that, and they'll be, they'll be off. And so this was a problem. I couldn't get the conversation started. And I'd want to talk about programming because it's super interesting. So now I lie. They ask me, what do you do? I say, I'm a musician. You know, like if you look, look to the thing today, it says live coding musician. Or I'm not really a musician, I'm a coder. But it's a lie because they go, oh, cool. What do you play? I go, code, code. <laughs> like, OK, so what does that mean? So this is, this is a critical thing. So, here we are, this is the system. It's totally free, you download it, it runs on, your, uh, runs on the Raspberry Pi, of course, that's what it was originally developed for, but it also runs on a Mac, runs on a PC. If you're into that free operating system, it's called Linux, it runs on that as well. Um, and you can learn to code. So you type some words, can you read that? Is it big enough? Um, and you run the code, and obviously it doesn't do anything because code is very precise, and you have to say the right words, and that's a bit finickety. So in this system, the magic words to know uh, is the word play. And we can use that to play a number, and we can hear that number. We can try a different number, or a different number. And this is what I enjoy doing. I did this program here. I'm going to see if it's going to work. In a cinema in the Netherlands, in Ada, had amazing subwoofers, and it just completely, no, we haven't got much bass in here. Let's, uh, let's go for a larger amplitude. Oh, yes, there we are. Yeah, so you can actually test these things. And this is actually a critical thing in schools. Often schools have really crappy speakers and it's not very engaging. So I always go to the teachers, get the best speakers you can because it's going to excite the kids. So, but what we're seeing here is seeing, seeing a, a program, which is often the first program that many children will write, uh, and uh, it's there. And, and you can play around, you can change this, you can, make a, you can play multiple notes at the same time. Let's play 30 and 56, say, as a chord. 
Or I could even like, uh, uh, play notes 60 over a long period, like eight seconds. But I can actually change that to different sound. I can use synth uh, profits like this. Oh no, what's going on with this? I'm getting there. Oh, I need to change the release time to eight. And maybe let's drop that down to like 12. Change the cutoff value maybe to like 70. There we are. Now, you don't need to know what this means, right? All you need to know... <laughs> yeah? No, don't clap yet. I've got, I've got four minutes left. I'm going to do something more exciting. No, all you need to know is that every single concept in here I've taught and successfully taught and teachers have successfully taught to 10-year-old children. So this is a critical thing. Everything, even though this might look alien, it's just something new. And there's a huge critical difference between things which are complicated and things which are just you don't yet understand. And the things you don't yet understand might actually be complicated, or they might, might be really simple. You just haven't yet understood it yet. I'm, I'm promising to you this is really simple. It just might not be something you yet understand. Um, and I'm going to quickly show you all the things you can do. So you can play samples. Here is a really cool sample, which you might recognize. Right? And this was used by Dr. Dre in the 80s. He, he uh, rapped on top of this and played at half speed. Yeah? And then I can, in London, we did it a few layers later, we did this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> and that's, a, that's the same sample, just played faster. You can even do things like this, play in reverse. Yeah, or like, uh, I can actually do things like create a loop. And I'm going to play, uh, let's play the onset zero. Play the first drum, right? I can separate it out, a second drum, or a third drum, or a fourth drum, or a random drum. Mm. So what we're seeing here is like randomization and operation, uh, doing some really fun stuff. But then again, we've got four lines of code. Now, you might not be able to read that right now, but I'm promising to you that if you do spend time learning this system, this will be really obvious to you. Uh, and, and obvious the way is that you'll be able to do this. This is the critical, critical thing. Um, no, no, no joke, because Sarah, the, the, the performer, she learned Sonic Pi at, uh, I think it was a university or school, and uh, at, at one of her lessons, and she was like, this is cool, and she just kept learning it and learning it and working on it and practicing and coding and p performing and composing, and, and there she is at that point. Um, so, got two minutes left. What else can you do? I'm going to show you, like, a, a, a fun thing to do is, is to take a... Oh, my, my things aren't working. Take a, a folder, for example, of samples. So I bought these samples for like ten pounds from somewhere, where you can uh, you have the rights then to perform with them, so you don't have to worry about copyrights. And I can take any of these samples, like uh, let's take this one, and I can drop it into Sonic Pi. It tells me where it is in the file system. I write the word sample in front of it, and it's gonna play a person singing. Let's call that uh, uh, foo, and I can say now sample foo. But I can also like start it at uh, 0.2 ways through it and finish at 0.5, say. And I'll Maybe you play it at half speed. That's pretty cool. Or like backwards. That's pretty cool as well, right? And so like maybe I can like change the BPM to 124. I can make it on these loops, which is going to repeat it. Sleep for. 16 seconds or beats. And now I can start to then. So it's going to keep repeating. Uh, let's go for lanes. Let's go for four. And then whilst it's playing. So my beats are only going for once they're not a run, so I get another one of these. Oh.
There you go. Thank you.